interviews with business owners that puts them in front of a global audience. And in behind those shows is a whole range of things, from digital magazines, to social media, to blogging, to email, to lead generation, just a whole range of things. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Everyday Business Show. I'm your host, Tony Lontis, and today we're going to be joined by another amazing guest with a wonderfully um, different topic to do with business. But before we get on with the show, just a reminder, if you're watching live on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, including Everyday Women's Network and Zondra Networks TV, please don't forget to look at the comments for all the connections and all the things that we talk about in the show today. If you want to catch up on any shows you've missed, don't forget to jump on YouTube to subscribe. Don't forget that we are live across EWN as you're watching this. This show is a pre-record. It allows us to add an intro and outro and tell you a bit more about our glorious guest and without further ado, I'm going to do a welcome to country and it goes a little bit like this. Today, I want to respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugamba language region on the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, and pay my respects to the elders past present and emerging and to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be watching or listening today, Thank you for listening and thank you for the part that you've played in developing Australia's cultural identity. Now, today we're going to talk about business succession and planning. And our wonderful guest, Laura Betchart from ProVision, um, is going to tell us all about that. And before we do, I think we need to introduce and tell you a little about Laura herself. Now, Laura is a CPA, MBA, Masters of Education and CEPA, is an experienced business learning and certified management professional. She has a unique background which combines finances and people and pro-business um, advisors is committed to helping business leaders plan for the future of their businesses and design a successful personal exit strategy sometime in the future. Now, we don't think a lot about this, so this is a great conversation to have with Laura today. As a certified exit planning advisor, Laura specializes in building valuable businesses helping leaders effectively plan for succession, accelerate the value of their business and work towards exit options and strategically prepare for the future. As a fourth generation business owner, Laura and her family began to bring their personal stories together and Laura's own stories and experiences of working with businesses and addressing the human side of business and financial well-being of the organisation. Laura, welcome to the show today. Again, apologies for my horse throat. Um, I'm actually going to try and let you do the bulk of the talking today because you have such wisdom around this particular topic and it's not one that we often talk about and that's succession in business. What happens next? How do we prepare? And I thought I'd start the show with one of your quotes and it goes like this, planning is bringing the future into the present so that we can do something about it now. And that quote is from Alan Lankin. Good morning or good evening or good night. Laura, how are you? I'm great. And uh, so, uh, thanks so much for inviting me on the show. Uh, uh, for us, it's this evening. So it's, uh, it, I'm, yeah. I'm thrilled to be, uh, to be a guest on your program tonight. So what does that quote mean? Uh, for me, that, that really is the essence of, of being accountable, being a victor, not a victim. Uh, you know, we, we think about 
sometimes life is what happens to you, yeah. but it's how we respond to it. And we can anticipate a lot of very typical things that are going to happen in the future um, and plan for them now so that we're thinking about them, we're mitigating any risks associated with them, and we're going to be in a much better place in the future by thinking about those obstacles that are going to come our way because we know that they're going to be there and we can we can count on a couple of hands what the major ones will be and the probabilities of them. Laura, this is a lovely niched part in um, business where we're talking about how we're going to exit business and you've got some stories and I'm wondering if you can share with us those stories because those stories are the thing that prompted you to go into advising businesses on their exit strategy. Can you talk through some of those stories, Laura? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tony. So uh, the fourth generation family business is really what has, what sparked my interest in this field. Uh, I have been educating uh, in higher education and college a lot of entrepreneurs for a lot of my professional career. And at the same time that I was doing that, my husband and I were becoming the successors in the uh, in the in his family uh, business, and ultimately uh, purchased the business from his parents. Uh, and so I saw firsthand, and I experienced firsthand what that succession and exit was like in the family. And um, I'm looking back at it as as my mother used to say, you can't put an old head on young shoulders. Mm. But looking back at those experiences that I had as a 20 something new bride with, you know, the the romance and the and, and you know willing to do whatever you what you could to support your your spouse and your partner was it could have been so much smoother and so much uh, easier for us. Yes, if there had been some planning, and really more communication uh, earlier on in, in, the, in the succession. Um, so that I, as the, the daughter-in-law coming into this relationship and into this business, had a better understanding of the impact this business was going to have on, on me personally, mm -hmm. and then our family and our children as, as, uh, we, as our family began to grow. And so what I learned by my own experience and the entrepreneurs that I was teaching is we, our story really wasn't that unique. There were a lot of individuals who were going through the same struggles that were about the human side of the business. Um, and some of the human problems were, 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 would have been a lot less significant if we had a little bit more financial acumen in the business. And so those are, that's sort of why I've blended those two together in the work that I do. So, you know, sometimes as entrepreneurs, it's like, it's like parenting. If you didn't have to take a course to become a parent and you didn't have to take any kind of course to become an entrepreneur, um, people are often really passionate about what they do, what services they provide, what products they sell, what solutions they're bringing to the universe, the world, their market. Uh, but sometimes what they're missing is that language of business and the financial part of really, really getting those financial and business systems into their business so that they can really enjoy their business more than many entrepreneurs are. Laura, as a daughter-in-law coming into that situation, your husband would have had a reasonable amount of knowledge about the business by virtue of the fact it was his parents. But you, however, didn't come with that same understanding, did you? No, I didn't. I was fortunate enough that I came, that I did have entrepreneurs in my family. So I mm. understood a little bit of the entrepreneurial part. My sister was an entrepreneur. My grandparents had been entrepreneurs. Um, and so I did understand that, that entrepreneurial, that all those, some of those entrepreneurial challenges, mm -hmm. but not in that particular business. And I happened to marry an introvert who was not a chatty Cathy. And so even though he may have known more about the business than, 
um, than I did for sure. Uh, he wasn't always just telling me about it. And with, without knowing what questions to ask, I wasn't eliciting the information that I was that I was I was really yearning for to be able to understand it. And the other the other thing that came into our situation was I was the first business first family member in the business that actually had a business background. Mm -hmm. And so when I would come into the business or and it was asking questions about why do we do things that way or what's that investment supposed to yield? I'm looking for return on investment kinds of factors. And a lot of my initial questions were perceived, uh, were not perceived the way I intended. They were, you know, I, they were perceived as being critical when I was, you know, for me, I was curious. I wanted to understand the business part of this business. And at that time, it really was what many small business owners are doing and what we call is a lifestyle business. It was a business that generated enough cash flow to provide a lifestyle for the entrepreneur, but it, they weren't running it like a very, like a serious business uh, in terms of setting up business processes for sure. Ah. So Laura, when we're talking about um, the return on investment of planning for succession and um, future exit, why can't we just leave our businesses to our hairs, for instance? Uh, yeah, that's a question that I that I get a lot. I did a family mm -hmm. business study a few years back, and that was often what uh, founders wanted to say. I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to talk about it. Why can't I just leave it all to my, I'm just going to leave it all to my kids in my will. But they, they're going to get it all. And and so, you know, so you, after after you have a little laugh with them mm -hmm. about that, you say, okay, that's that. That is a strategy. It is a, an option. But here are some of the things that I'd like you to consider why that might not be the best option uh, for your family or your business, and or in many cases, either one of them. Uh, and so, you know, really, if you're not planning for that, that exit, you, you're losing control. Um, so that's one of the things that founders don't like to do is lose control. Yeah. Um, you're also really threatening the continuity of your business. Yes, uh, because there, if you don't identify those potential successors early and prepare them for the roles in advance, and sometimes their families or their spouses or their children, they're not prepared to go into that role. Um, the financial security, uh, if you're not maximizing the, uh, the, the value of your business on exit, it may not provide you with the the cash flow, and if, if you're dead, you say, I don't need it, but maybe you're, you've left a spouse or a partner who is still depending somewhat on that cash flow. Mm. Um, and if you're not planning for taxes, I don't care what country you're in, you're going to have a lot less at the end of the day than you may have had. And then, and we've, we've had lots of situations here where on, the heirs have had to sell the business assets to pay the taxes. Um, because the tax man wants to get paid when someone dies. And, uh, and so if you've got, you know, assets that have appreciated a lot in value, it, there's going to be taxes on that transfer into to the heirs or to the next generation. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's lots of those kinds of reasons. There's financial reasons, there's relationship reasons. We don't necessarily want uh, the heirs to be having squabbles and fights about the business and who's doing what and what roles you're having. Uh, and if you're growing your business to the point where you have non-family members involved in your business, very scary for them. And oh, they, yes, because they, they're they, reliant on the business, aren't they? They are. They are reliant. And, they, and, and we don't have the opportunity now to bring them in, retain mm -hmm. them by even giving them a minority interest in the business mm -hmm. so that we can, we can include them as part of our succession, um, get loyalty out of them. You lose a lot of flexibility if you're just if you're not planning for that exit, uh, yes. because like one of my one of my clients says you're only as good as your options, mm -hmm. and when you back yourself into a corner, you don't have very many options, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's so it's people often are are falling back on that as their exit plan because they actually don't know all the consequences that could happen by choosing to do that. Yeah. 
Laura, if you've got a service-based business, and I've heard this often because I have family members in service-based business and their plan is to just shut the doors when um, when they're ready to retire. There's alternatives to doing that though, isn't there? Oh, absolutely, Tony. Absolutely. And it makes it makes it makes me sad when I hear service-based business owners thinking about that because there's there's so much sweat equity that goes into building a business that mm. that whether the shareholder loans, you're bootstrapping it on your credit card, you're not getting paid for years, yeah. you're putting cash into the business, like yeah. whatever way you are doing it, there's a lot that goes in. There's a lot of sacrifice and trade-off that you're making. Yeah. And the only way you get an ROI on that sweat equity is if you sell your business at the end yeah. of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, people think about, well, I don't have any assets. Nobody's going to want to buy my business. Um, and so, but you have, if you've had a successful, even lifestyle kind of business that's service based, you have been, you've got, you've had a cash flow and you have clients, you have business systems. You probably, you know, you may or may not have digital assets like a website or Facebook mm. followers mm. or a brand of some sort. And that's so valuable, assets, isn't it, Laura? Yes. Those, those assets can be sold individually or in bulk, uh -huh. um, and even to recover your cost of those things. Yeah. Um, and you can, but you can sell, it, it, it's thinking about what kind of buyer. So, um, you know, a competitor might be willing to buy you out because there, it's a customer, it's mm -hmm. a customer acquisition play for them. So they're buying all of your customers. We often call that selling my book of business. And so if you're a service-based business and you don't have a lot of other assets, that's very common. And lots of mm -hmm. industries sell their client lists. They sell their book mm -hmm. of business. Uh, you could merge with a complementary business. So the complementary would be somebody that's in the food chain. So yeah. if you're a painter, for example, you might merge with someone who does uh, window covering. So those would be complementary businesses. And one, you could merge, you could become a partnership for a while before the other buys you out. Mm -hmm. You can sell to employees or contractors. Um, so there are lots of different ways, family members, even looking towards your, to your extended family, you might have nieces or nephews who are out of college or you know, starting out on their own and, and walking into a cash flow is so much more beneficial oh, yes. than starting from zero. scratch. Mm. Mm -hmm. Laura, do you help businesses with those conversations about the value and then what if we sold this or that or as a whole? Do you help and assist with all of those conversations? Yeah, absolutely, Tony. Uh, I really, I help. That's that's primarily what 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 we do at Provision Business is we have those strategic conversations. Mm -hmm. So we help people identify um, kind of as a benchmark where value is and where value isn't, mm -hmm. uh, and give them you know give them a give them some pointers of where they could invest strategically in the next several years. And um, some of the initiatives they may be able to implement and get an ROI on sooner than others. It's sort of, you know, sort of like if you wanted to put solar panels on your house. It's an investment it's that you're a not value add mm -hmm. for, for for a while, right? But it's mm -hmm. value add. So when we think about accelerating the business, usually a value of a business, usually the first thing we do is we look at where can we reduce risk. Mm -hmm. Because the risk when a buyer is looking at your business, a buyer just sees where all the all the leaks are in the bucket. They don't see how, where the bucket may have been overflowing. And so we come in initially and we look at some of those risks uh, and we we try to shore up those risks. There's just lots of different risk man, risk mitigation strategies. Yeah. Sometimes it's just documenting something that's in somebody's head. Then you have reduced or mitigated that risk to a potential buyer. Uh, sometimes it is using tools like insurance to help mitigate some risk. So there's lots of different things that we can bring into play uh, when we start talking about risk. But we that's the, the initial conversation we have with people is benchmarking where they would score on these typical value drivers. Mm -hmm. And then they can, you know, take it and run with it if they want. Um, what we really enjoy doing is is working collaboratively with their accountants or their other advisors so that on an annual basis, 
we're sort of saying, how did you move the needle this year? Like now that you've operated, how can you add value to that that business? Yeah. What uh-huh. did you, what did you what 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 initiatives did you stand up this year, um, and did how did they move the needle? How are they coming along? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it focuses an entrepreneur not only on generating cash flow and income, but also building that valuable asset that at the end of the day, not only will you um, get a good dollar for it, but you'll even have buyers willing to come to the table. Very good. Um, The elements of a business, can you give us some idea on the value? So how do you, how you give value to a business? That's, that can, that seems like an open ended question, but I'm assuming that this is your expertise and you know, the bits of a business to look for and what that value is worth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's not it's not so different from a house, right? So it depends on depends on the location of the house what the mm-hmm. value is going to be, mm-hmm. um, and it depends if it's a condo or a thing, a detached family home or an yeah. apartment building, multifamily complex. So there is some some of that complexity that goes into into valuing a business. Mm-hmm. But in simple terms, um, you know, lots of businesses talk about multiple multiples or multipliers. And, and so, you know, we can look at, we can look at the assets of a business and value them from a, a value build that business from an asset perspective, which typically happens more if there's a lot of tangible assets. So for example, a farm, we'll have land and we'll have machinery and we'll have buildings and all of those. So, so those kinds of businesses have um, an anchor of the value on the, what those assets are worth. But oftentimes our businesses don't have all of those kinds of assets. They're, they are more service-based and their income flows. And so we have to take a different approach for them. And so we can either look backwards, which is very typical. We look backwards at historical cash flows or historical financial performance for the business. But we could look forward as well. So if we have a business that's been operating for quite a while, can you know, we, that's why we study history in school. The past yeah. predicts the future. Yeah. Yeah. So the past is assumed to be predictive of the future cash flows of the business. Uh, if we have a business that's more startup, that's been growing a lot, then, then historical might not be good representation of what is to come. Um, and we saw that even during COVID. A lot yeah. of businesses took a hit during yes. COVID. Yes. So if we had looked at, you know, if we just looked historically at what they did the last three years through the COVID recession, wouldn't really paint the right picture of where that yes. value is. So we may look, we may look into the future, um, especially when they started coming out and we could, we could now demonstrate a growth rate or we could see the return to a, a more healthy income stream. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, what we look at in finance is something called, um, EBITDA, which is a term that's usually familiar. So it stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So it standardizes an earnings figure sort of across uh, comparisons because it it eliminates interest because how you choose to finance your business is maybe different from how I choose to finance it. So, So I may not have any interest and you might have more interest. Um, And taxes are different in every jurisdiction and how people decide to amortize or depreciate assets can be a matter of principle. So we just sort of even. And it's different across countries as well. So America is different. So we just take those things out. Mm. Yeah. We just take those things out. And so we've kind of, kind of recreate the net income with a cash basis rather than what we, what we would do with the accounting standards. And then from there, we, we, we use what we call a multiplier. And the multiplier itself is set by, depends on the industry you're in. Uh-huh. Um, and that really is set by the private equity markets or the stock markets. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you're in an industry where the multipliers are between two and four, then you know, you're likely going to be between two and four. If you're in an industry where the multipliers are 10 to 15, then you're uh-huh. likely going to be in that range. So where you where you sit in that range yes. is going to be is what you have influence over by choosing to accelerate the value and strategically work on 
these areas that will build the value of your business. And that's where your planning comes in, yes. even as a baseline planning yes. for business growth, but it can yes. then lead on to that succession yes. or exit yes. strategy for that particular business. And some, and Tony, some of my clients have actually really have, have fundamentally changed their business model because they want to get into a different multiplier range. Ah, and they say, oh, that's if I'm, interesting. If I'm here, I'm in this multiplier range. But if I actually changed my business so I was in this industry rather than this industry, I would have a lot higher multiplier range. And, and so they have fu fundamentally changed their businesses. But again, yeah. that's where planning comes in because it you can't turn that around overnight. No, that's it's a bit of a bit of a process in itself, isn't it? Yes, yeah. And Laura, so, you know, when I yeah, go on, go on, you go. No, so you know when I when I t talk to people who are who are looking at at you know growing their business and I look at the multipliers that are in it and I think you know why don't we try to tweak your business so that. You fit better in this industry mm -hmm. rather than um, trying to look more in this. So we have companies that are going from consulting to now building platforms because they want to be in the software as a service industry, yes, not yes, a consulting yes, industry. Yes. So that's that's a common example of mm -hmm. what people are doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Laura, if you're thinking about or this program's prompted you to start to thinking about succession planning and exit strategies and and that where do we start you've got a bit of a help for people to get yeah. them started on the journey yeah we actually do this do that that benchmark that i mentioned we'll, mm. we'll do a complimentary uh, assessment for with individuals so they can they can click on a link it only takes 15 20 minutes maybe yeah. to do it online and then we will circle back with them and book a, a complimentary half hour or so to run through the results with them, which gives them a little bit of a starting point. Absolutely. It's a valuable thing to start thinking. So even if this um, interview and show today just prompts people to start thinking about what's going to happen in the future, what what would happen if I popped off the, the earth sooner than I, you know, it, it's not about being morbid. It's actually about no. thinking ahead and protecting you, your lifestyle, your business, your family. It, it's, it's quite a, it's a wonderful it's, place to start thinking about. Yeah. It's actually a gift that you can leave your family if you have a plan. Um, cause you know, when I talk to people that are entrepreneurs about their wills and I say, who's your executor and they'll often say it's their spouse or it's mm -hmm. one of their kids or it's, I said, do they know anything about your business? Mm -hmm. Because if you're running a business and there's, you know, you suddenly have an accident or you're, you pass away, that executor has to keep the lights on and keep the business going. And if yeah. they're not trained and they don't even know where the passcodes are, it's yeah. going to be very difficult for them to even keep the lights on. Yeah, absolutely, Laura. Um, what a wonderful service um, that you provide and a wonderful discussion today about something that's not often talked about. I want to digress in the last few moments and where do you see, in talking about succession planning, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, one of my one of my uh, favorite authors is Stephen Covey, and you know, begin with the end in mind, and that's really what we're talking about with succession and exit. Is when you start something, think about how you're going to end it. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, where do I see myself in five years? I actually see myself doing pretty much what I'm doing today. Tony is helping people uh, think about and plan for. Succession and succession and exit are two different events. They're very uh, different, aren't they? Yeah, sometimes they happen simultaneously, mm -hmm. but sometimes they happen decades apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, succession is always talking about who's, where's your bench strength, or who's mm -hmm. going to follow in your footsteps in the jobs that you have in your business mm -hmm. or the jobs that you have. And then the exit is really more about what people when we think about selling or the ownership transition, but those can be very different dates and different years. 
Yeah. And so some people do think they're synonyms, but they're not. No. No, good point, Laura. Um, if people are listening to this conversation today and it's just triggered something in them to go, oh, gosh, I've not thought about that, what's the best way to connect with you? So we will have links to your um, value builder system uh, within the show notes that go with our interview today. But other than that, how can people connect with you and have a conversation, Laura? Um, it's best probably just to connect with me by email, uh, Laura mm -hmm. at provisionbusinessadvisors.com. Uh, you, I'm happy to have people give me a call, but uh, yes. all over the world, it's a yes. Canadian phone number. So you, you can, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn as yeah. well. Uh, because send me a message on Facebook. Laura, this yeah. information is, is global. The way that you mm -hmm. give advice is global. It's standardized yes. for business across the planet effectively yeah. so it's not just about um canada north america it is global and if again if you're listening to laura and i talk about this very important subject today and you suddenly thought oh gosh i hadn't actually thought about that i've just been focused on growth and profit and um anything else that goes on in the day-to-day -day of running a business and you've not actually thought about what comes next, what am I planning to do? Or even if you just have a vague idea, like myself, <laughs> about what will happen in the future, perhaps it might be a good idea to start that conversation with Laura and the team to just get a bit of an idea because, Laura, as you said, it might change the way you do things or you plan to do things. Yeah, one of I I love talking to entrepreneurs early in their journey because that talking early helps them avoid some of the pitfalls down yeah. the path. And one one of my uh, one of my uh, clients and colleagues who uh, associates in one of my business networking groups, I, I I went through this process with him when he was in his first eighteen months of business. Wow! And he still will say. He says, I'm doing what I'm doing because I did that work with Laura and I thought, I'm not doing that. I'm not having that happen yes. to me. So, so earlier in his business, he, he took some strategic direction mm -hmm. so that he could avoid some of the common pitfalls of business owners because he does want to position yeah. his business to be, to be sold eventually. Yeah. So Laura, the best way you, one of the things you can do immediately is to jump on and do fill out the um, value builder system questionnaire. That's the right wording, isn't it? Yeah. It's a questionnaire. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a diagnostic, a self-assessment questionnaire. Yeah. And it'll allow you to start thinking about the things that you may or may not want to do. And it might just be the thing that kickstarts a whole new thought pattern for you and a whole new way of doing business if you have the end in sight. And um, your example just then of the early start in his business and how it changed the way he thought about it, it can be a powerful tool, can't it? Yeah, Absolutely. And I encourage if there's partners in the business, I encourage both of them to do it because, and I say, you know, you're not going to get the same score yeah. so, because you, you're going to have different perceptions of the business. Some of you might understand, a, a, perceive a question differently than the mm -hmm. other one, but you also have different roles in the business. Yes. So, you know, your if your score is the same, it's going to be a coincidence, not, um, not sort of expected. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's it's just it's it's a conversation starter, um, and it's it's a way to start thinking about some of these very important strategic directions for your business. Definitely, Laura and your family. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because you you know you don't want to be in that place where you inherit a business and you've got no idea about it beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you don't want to think that your only option is to close doors and walk away because you want to know all the different options that you may or may not have for your particular yeah. business. They're going to be different in each and every case. Yeah, yeah. There, like there's there's only a finite group of scenarios, but yeah. sometimes people haven't thought about some yes. of those scenarios. Um, and, and then and then at the other end of the spectrum, we have I have people that are you know trying to struggling to make their first hundred thousand dollars and they think that they're going to 
have a private equity group come in and fund them. I mean, oh, that's not so realistic, honey. You know, yeah. I don't know if that's really going to happen right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 it, and some of them have never thought about things like worker owned incentives and cooperatives and just different ways of, of, yes. of exiting the business. So it just provides them with food for thought and some information. Definitely. Laura, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing with us your knowledge and wisdom in that wonderful space of succession or exit planning. Um, it's a privilege to have you to talk to. I've loved our conversation today. Now, audience, I want you to make sure that you connect with Laura, even if it's just a little conversation about, oh, I'd never thought about that. Or how do I start or I'm at retirement age and I've not thought about this. Can you guide me through the process? Laura from Pro Business, uh, Pro Vision Business Advisors. I'm getting my words twisted this afternoon. Um, please talk to Laura. Her and the team are very um, wise in and have great understanding around the business and entrepreneurial um arena and they can help you get to that next point in working out how you're going to do things and it will be a valuable conversation to have with Laura. Laura thank you for coming on the show today. Oh you're welcome Tony thank you so much for inviting me it's great to see you again. <laughs> it's wonderful that I get to talk with women who are so wise and have such great experience I learn something every time I interview someone and talking to Laura today is no different that my friends is your lot for this week on the everyday business show I'm your host we've been talking to Laura Bechard and we'll be back next week with another guest bye for now shows with business owners that puts them in front of a global audience and in behind those shows is a whole range of things from digital magazines to social media to blogging to email to lead generation just a whole range of things 